Good morning, Wall Street. Welcome into church on a, another cold winter day. It's nice and warm in here. We're going to start with singing My Love Colors Outside the Lines. Please sing along if you will. Words should be on the screen. to most of us, even though it's an old camp song, but uh, Josh introduced, introduced it to us on at Celebrate Life last Sunday, so now we all get a chance. I believe that 
that you're here now. I believe that you're here now. Standing in our midst, hear the power to heal now. With the power to heal now. And the grace to forgive. Just music. Street. Good morning. Oh, that was good. <laughs> nice to see you all out at braving the, the cold this morning and uh, coming into the warmth of the sanctuary and the warmth of our uh, church family as we gather to praise God together this morning. If you're visiting with us or a newcomer to the area, we welcome you here this morning and hope you do feel part of our family. We like to get together for a cup of coffee after, which is good before going out in this weather. Uh, so please feel free to join us after the service in Heritage Hall, which is straight through the back doors at the center here for a time of coffee and fellowship together. It is flu season. We're going to uh, greet each other. Feel free to touch elbows, touch fists, uh, just be kind to each other as we do it. And uh, let's take time to uh, welcome each other this morning. We have gathered in this place to worship because Jesus invites us all to come. We come as we are with our faith and our doubts, with our successes and our failures. We come with what we have, bringing with us the events and experiences of this past week because Jesus invites us to come. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us come and worship God. And let's stand together and sing our opening hymn, That All Things Now Living.
present with us, Lord, for if you are not, then we, there's no reason for us to be here. By your Spirit, Lord, teach us in this hour. Draw close to us. Open the eyes of our hearts, our mind, our soul, that we might draw closer to your presence and leave this place lighter and brighter and stronger through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, have we got any kids here today? Such a cold day, they're all at home under their blankets. Oh, there's one. There's two. Oh, okay. There's three. Okay. I, uh, the other day, I was getting the coffee pot ready. You got a book? It's a nice book on volcanoes, yeah. Mm, yeah. I like volcanoes. If you look in it, it shows you where all the volcanoes are. Oh, if you look inside, it shows you where all the volcanoes are. Can you bring that back after church and show me again so I can read it? Thank you. Now, I was making coffee the other day, and before you make it, it, you have to, hmm? Did you put nuts in it? Uh, just coffee nuts. No other kind. There's a little gadget you have to take off because we live in the country and our water is hard. And you take that gadget off and you bang it out and you get all these, these little bits of crud out that are called lime or scale or calcium. Now, hang on, let me finish now. And, and I, I looked at them and as I do every day, I throw them in the garbage. Well, the other day I looked at them, then I looked at them, then I looked at them. No, no, I didn't eat them. What I did was I got out a, a microscope I've got. Those are the little specks. You want to see them? Sure. Little round specks. And in the picture, you can see a pin. Because I wanted to get an idea. No, that's a pin. Because the little specks are the size of a head of a pin. Yeah, it's a little sewing pin. Now, I took those little specks and I put them under a microscope. Yes. I and you know what I discovered? What? The coffee bean? <laughs> I'm not even going to repeat that. <laughs> I discovered that they were beautiful. They were beautiful. Those little tiny specks were beautiful. And I have a rock collection, in case you didn't know. Hold on, i got something to say here now. And... The same stuff, the lime, that was in the coffee pot, also makes caves. Caves? Yeah. Like and you know, the, have you ever seen pictures of the big caves when, when, when the, the uh, columns come down? Have you seen those? The stalactites go down and they drip and drip and they get longer and longer and the bottom, you start, another one starts, the stalagmite, and it goes up and up and up, and then they meet in the middle and they make these big columns underground in big caves. Well, here's the beginning of one of those columns. Hey, that's there the it is. Thing or the that's the same thing. Um, this is a little stone puddle, and that's made of the same stuff as the stuff inside our coffee maker. Now turn Not it over, it looks better. Not a shell. Could be argued, it's the same stuff. See all the crystals in there? Oh yeah, that's cool. You see the spot in the middle where the water dripped down and started making stone as it hardened? Those were the same kind of crystals that was in my coffee maker. Oh. That's something. Uh, then it got me thinking. A rock, a rock puddle, it's a rock puddle. I didn't. I took them out of the coffee pot before I made the coffee, so I didn't eat them. You're full of beans today, aren't you? Thank you. Now, it got me thinking, if God takes all the care to make beautiful crystals in tiny little specks in a coffee pot, how beautiful are each one of us? And how important are each one of us? You're beautiful and important? And you're beautiful and important, and you're beautiful and important, and you're beautiful and important. Let's say a prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For all the wonders of nature. 
for all the wonders of nature. And the greatest wonder of all? And the greatest wonder of all. That you love us. That you love us. Amen. Who knows the question? Who's Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, don't go away. The band is going to sing a chorus, or we're going to sing a chorus. this morning is taken from Luke chapter 4 verses 16 to 21. He came to Nazareth where he had been reared. As he always did on the Sabbath, he went to the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, God's spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the place was on him, intent. Then he started in. You've just heard scripture, make history. It came true just now in this place. And reading from Psalm 146, verses 3 to 9. Don't put your life in the hands of experts who know nothing of life, of salvation life. Mere humans don't have what it takes. When they die, their projects die with them. Instead, get help from God of Jacob. Put your hope in God and know real blessing. God made sky and soil, sea and all the fish in it. He always does what he says. He defends the wronged. He feeds the hungry. God frees prisoners. He gives sight to the blind. He lifts up the fallen. God loves good people. 
protects strangers, takes the side of orphans and widows, but makes short work of the wicked. In these readings, we hear God's voice. Let's pray together. Loving God, as we do come before you today, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this place. We give you thanks for the ability to come, the freedom to come together to worship you, to gain strength from each other, to learn, to just be filled with your spirit as we come to worship you together. Lord, we give you thanks for those things in life that we often take for granted, limbs that are working well or sight that might be working well or different things that each day we may just not even stop to think about. And we just thank you for the amazing blessings that you give us. And for those things that aren't working so well, we uh, come before you and pray for your hand to be upon us, to give us the strength that we need to uh, soldier on on the difficult days. And Lord, we do think about those who we have listed off and so many others who are facing health concerns in our church right now. There are those also who may be waiting for surgery, may be waiting for the results of medical tests that have been done. There are those that carry chronic illness each day of their lives, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, things that just each day are a challenge to life. And Lord, we pray for those, too, who care for those who suffer. We pray for those who are looking after relatives who are going through a difficult time. Having to see loved ones suffer is such a hard thing on our hearts, Lord. And so for each person, we just pray for strength. We pray for hope. 
We pray for your comfort. We pray for your peace to just flow over each of our friends who are suffering or watching their loved ones suffer. Lord, we pray for those who perhaps are going through a tough financial time in life and just wonder each week how they're going to pay the bills and keep warm and have food in their stomachs. We pray for jobs. We pray for ways to be able to provide. Lord, we think about our, our world and the challenges that it has, and we think of the poverty and the, those who suffer each day. And We pray for nations. We pray for leaders and the people within each nation to think of the needs of others, to do their best each day to put things in place that will let other people's lives be better. And we pray for hope amidst strife, hope amidst turmoil, hope in the midst of war. And Lord, we thank you for the stories that we hear from places of people doing miraculous things in tough circumstances. And Lord, today our hearts really go out to the people of Lille Ver in Quebec. We think of the injured, we think of the families, of the victims, of the seniors who perished there. And we think of those who attended the scene, the emergency personnel and the effect that it must have had on their lives as well, and on that community as a whole, where I'm sure everybody knew someone who was affected. And so, Lord, we pray for your healing to fall upon the community, and we pray for your peace, and we pray for peace amidst questions that may never be unanswered and the strength and the hope to carry on. And Lord, we just thank you that we are able to come before you in prayer. We are thankful to know that we're not alone on this planet. That we have someone who loves us and cares for us and can bring us strength. And someone that we can celebrate with too in those joyful days when we have things to celebrate. So be with us, Lord, now as we continue to worship you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms. Above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what your worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone.
Well, three boys were playing in the schoolyard when one of the boys said to the other two boys, Guess what? My dad just scribbles some words down on a piece of paper and he calls it a poem and they give him 50 bucks for it. Well, the second boy said, That's nothing. He said, Because my dad scribbles down a bunch of words on a piece of paper and he calls it a song and they give him a hundred bucks for that. Well, the third boy said, I got you all beat. He said, my dad, he scribbles down a bunch of words on a piece of paper and he calls it a sermon and it takes eight people with baskets to collect all the money. <laughs> oh, you notice here at Wall Street we always have the collection before the sermon just in case you don't like it. But uh, <laughs> So what's that got to do with today's message? Absolutely nothing. Just thought we could do it with a little laugh this morning. <laughs> Well, folks, there's one thing in our lives that every single one of us here is called to do, and that's ministry. It doesn't matter if you're being paid to do it as an ordained minister or if it's part of your duty to do as a Christian. It's part of our DNA. It's what we're about. We're all called to ministry. And Jesus gave us a model on how to minister to other people. This morning I want to look at who Jesus came to help when he came here to earth. And next week, Pastor Kim is then going to talk about how Jesus ministered to those particular people that we're going to talk about today. Um, so why should we do this? Why should we minister to other people? Why should we do what Jesus modeled for us to do? And it's very simple. Jesus told us that's what we're supposed to do. So let's first look this morning at who Jesus came to help. And Scripture is very clear on this, because Jesus said that he came to help five distinctive types of people. And I believe that every single one of us at some time in our lives falls into one of these categories. And it says that Jesus came to help the poor, the brokenhearted, the prisoners, the blind, and the oppressed. And I know myself at some time I've fallen into one of those categories, and I'm sure that all of us will fall into one of those categories at some time in our lives. So let's first look at the first type of person that Jesus came to help. First, Jesus said, I came to preach good news to the poor. And you know, there's different types of poverty. The first type, of course, is material poverty. And I don't know about you, I don't know if you saw this in the CTV the other day, but I was absolutely appalled to read the Oxfam survey that came out, or report that came out last week, in which they state that the richest 85 people in the world, 85 people, the richest 85 people have the same amount of wealth as half of the world's population. 85 people that we could put into Heritage Hall have the same amount of money as half of the world's population population. And I don't know, but in me that sort of stirred something up and I thought, oh, I'd love to go down there and kick down the gate of their mansion and tell them they got to be doing something for the poor. And then a dose of reality set in. We had the opportunity, like Pastor Al did at one time as well, to live in Zambia, one of the ten poorest nations on earth. And it soon hit me, of course, that I am one of the richest people on earth. It's all relative because I live in a country where when you compare what I earn to what people earn around the world, I am one of the wealthiest people on earth. I remember when we first went to Zambia, we had a, a queue of people lined up at the door the, our first morning there for different things, for money, for different things. And I was thinking to myself, why are they lined up here? I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be in the, the lower level of the income in the world. And it took about two days to get a total reality check and realize that I was the wealthiest person in the compound in which we lived. It's a shocking thought that 85 people in this world have as much money as half the population of the world. We need to hurt inside for those who suffer in poverty and do everything we can to reach out to them in practical ways. And this church is good at that but we can be better. This church is good because it does have a heart for the poor. 
but we can be better. There's more that we can do. There's other kinds of poverty too, though. There's moral poverty. Moral poverty is when people don't seem to have the ability to be able to decide between right, what's right, and what's wrong. Don't have that foundation to be able to do what is right for other people as opposed to just doing what they think they need for themselves. A third type of poverty is spiritual poverty. And spiritual poverty is when people go through their whole lives not knowing that God has a purpose for their life. They can go through their whole life and not realize that God created them for a specific purpose that only they can do and that they can only fulfill if they have God working in their lives. That's spiritual poverty. Mother Teresa was once asked, what is the worst type of poverty that you have ever seen? This is Mother Teresa working among the poor in Calcutta. And she said, it's spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty. It's the poverty of feeling unloved. It's the poverty of loneliness. And Jesus came to show the spiritually poor that they are loved and that there's a purpose for their lives. The second group that Jesus said he came for, he said he came for the brokenhearted. He came for the brokenhearted. He said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. Now most people I've met in life at some point in their lives have had a broken heart. At some point. It's very hard, I think, to go through life without at some time in your life having a broken heart. And the first ever recorded use of the phrase broken heart is actually found in the Bible. In Psalm 69, verse 20, when David says, insults have broken my heart. And do you know that a broken heart is also a medical condition? How many people knew that? Oh, oh, yeah, and all the nurses and people like that putting their hands up. <laughs> and, and people married to nurses. and Very good, that's good. <laughs> the Mayo Clinic defines it this way. Broken heart syndrome is a temporary heart condition brought on by stressful situations such as the death of a loved one. People with broken heart syndrome may have sudden chest pain or think they're having a heart attack. These broken heart synd- syndrome symptoms may be brought on by the heart's reaction to a surge of stress hormones. In broken heart syndrome, a part of your heart temporarily enlarges and doesn't pump well, while the remainder of the heart functions normally or even more, with more forceful contractions, also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, so it's a real condition. You can, you know, when you see someone who's lost a loved one and are really suffering health-wise as well, it can be a medical condition. It says going through constant stressful conditions can actually weaken your heart. And what can ho- cause broken hearts in our lives? A whole lot of different things. It can be disappointment. Life hasn't worked out the way that we really wanted it to work out. It could be rejection. Someone that we've loved has rejected us. Some it could be children, a spouse friends, people who have rejected us in some way. Resentment can also break our hearts. When you hold on to that disappointment or the rejection or the resentment, it can really damage us. And Jesus said, I came for people who are brokenhearted. In fact, the Bible says God is close to the brokenhearted. The third group that Jesus came for, I came to proclaim peace for the prisoners, for the prisoners. Jesus actually does care about the prisoners who are physically in our jails. When Debbie and I were federal correctional chaplains, we met a lot of caring, loving people behind bars. We also met some that you wouldn't want to bring home for supper for a while until hopefully there's some changes in their lives. But we met people who perhaps had made one massive mistake in their lives or found themselves in some situation where they chose wrong, who have spent the rest of their time now trying to be restored. The stories that have come out of people who have been in prison, who've changed their lives and come out and done amazing things on the outside are so many. Every day in our country, there's over 30,000 people who are in prison. And we need to pray for them. 
Every, de every Sunday where you come to church, through those doors, you are coming through the doors right across the road from a, from a prison, in the Brockville prison. Maybe some days as you come into church, just say a short prayer for those across the road, that God will put someone in their lives that will help them to see a way forward and a way of hope and a way of change. But there's other ways to be in prison. One of them is addictions. Addictions and compulsions imprison us. They bind us in chains, and sometimes the future can look so helpless. And God said, I want to give them freedom. The many testimonies that we hear on, at Celebrate Life, if you've never been to a Celebrate Life service, come out sometimes. Because sometimes the life-changing stories that are told at Celebrate Life can just show you the incredible power of God working in people's lives and God ha using other people to work in their lives to bring restoration, to bring freedom from addiction. People are also imprisoned by secrets. Perhaps it's a family secret. Perhaps it's something from your past that you've not been able to tell anybody about and it just keeps eating away inside of us. God wants us to find someone who we can trust, and that's a very important thing to say, or a so, professional that you can talk to, someone to be able to unload that, to be able to get help with that. Because if you carry it by yourself, it's only going to break your heart. And another type of imprisonment, ignorance or lack of education. We're lucky that we live in a country where education is there and available for most. There's some challenges in the north that we could look at, but... For most, the education is there, but we need to pray for those around the world where the lack of education is keeping people in poverty. But the number one thing that imprisons people today, and I think I can say this without any, I don't normally like to generalize, but I feel that overall the number one thing that imprisons us today is fear and anxiety. It's rife in our culture. It's there everywhere around us. We did a whole sermon series on that, I don't know if you remember, hopefully some of you remember, called Fear Less. And I'm looking to do a small group study in the spring or summer again on that, looking at the fears in our lives, the anxieties, the things that really imprison us each day and stop us from really living our lives fully the way that God would want us to live. Jesus said, I care about the people who are imprisoned. The fourth kind of pe people Jesus came for, he came to recover sight for the blind. When you're blind, you don't get to experience some of the things that other people get to experience. While you may develop your other senses to levels that those who are sighted may not be able to experience, there are some things you're going to miss in life. Right now in the world, there's over 50 million people who are physically blind. And God cares about them, and we should show our support to excellent organizations like the CNIB and their partners and agencies in our communities. But there's also more than just physical blindness. There's relational blindness. Relational blindness is when you don't take the time to work on your relationship and you don't see the things that are happening in your relationship and then we wonder why our relationships break down or why we find ourselves in trouble. There's also spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is when we close our eyes to the goodness of God in our lives. When we sort of attribute everything that, uh, or when we say that everything good that happens is because of things we've done and everything bad that happens, that's God's fault. That's spiritual blindness. When we fail to go to God for the good and the bad things. And finally, the fifth group of people that Jesus said he came to help were the oppressed. The oppressed. The oppressed are the people in life who are kicked around by their circumstances. They're put down, they're played upon, they're even taken advantage of. And one kind of oppression is political oppression. Again, we're quite lucky in this country to be able to live in a place where we can go and we can vote freely and we can vote out those who may um, cause us to uh, not want them to be in power anymore. But around the world, there are so many countries under political oppression. Do you know right now that there are 45 million refugees in the world. 45 million. It's more than the population of Canada. 
one of the highest levels, recorded levels in history. And some people have lived in refugee camps for over 20 years, living in those circumstances. Let me give you another shocker. Right now in the world, there are 30 million people in slavery, living in slavery. 30 million. Slavery is not something that we read about in the past from North America. There are currently that many people living in the world in what is considered slavery. Each year, 2 million girls between the ages of 5 and 15 are sold into the sexual commercial um, slave market. 2 million girls every year. Slavery is not a thing of the past. It's a current reality in our world. And if you th think God cares about that, absolutely God does. And there's also spiritual oppression. What is spiritual oppression? Spiritual oppression is when we're governed by clinical legalistic religion instead of, of right relationships with God and with others. Spiritual oppression is religion that marginalizes people because of the way that God made them, whether that be because of gender or race or creed or sexual orientation or age. Spiritual oppression is when we dispense the wrath of some vengeful God instead of the love and the hope and the compassion of the God that we serve, as shown through the ministry of Jesus. It's when we judge people instead of hugging God's love into people. That's spiritual oppression, and it has no place in a Christ-focused ministry. Jesus says, these are the kinds of people that I came for. And he says, I'm going to, preach uh, I'm going to preach messages that always begin with the hurt, the poor, the blind, the brokenhearted, the imprisoned, the oppressed. I'm going to preach good news to them, not bad news, good news to a hurting world. When people came to Jesus, they always came to him for three th one of three things, a need, a hurt, or a question. And Jesus didn't turn any of them away. Jesus wants us to come to him with our hurts, our needs, and our questions. At Wall Street, we try to preach about messages and topics that affect our everyday lives rather than going verse by verse through the liturgical scripture of the day. Why do we do that? Because Jesus did it. Jesus spoke to people through stories, through practical messages of the day. And he said this, he said, I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done to you. Just as people were hurting 2,000 years ago where Jesus walked, people are hurting 2,000 years later here in Brockville where each of us walk. And I bet that God wants us to care for them the same way that Jesus did. And next week, Pastor Kim is going to tell us exactly how we can do that. Today's message can be summed up in one final sentence. The great theologian Karl Barth, when lecturing to students and teachers at Dallas School of Divinity, was asked, after all your years of study, the books you've written, the lectures you've given, the debates with the greatest theological minds of the day, what is the greatest truth that you have learned? And after a long pause and reflection, the great theologian Karl Barth said these words, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. Leave here today knowing that Jesus loves you, and we do too. May God bless you. Let's stand together for our closing hymn, Lord, you give the great commission.
And may the unconditional love of God, the compassion and tender example of Jesus, and the guiding light of the Holy Spirit go with you as you go forth from here to be messengers of God's love. Amen. Let's join hands and sing together.